started. Thank you. So first things first, for accessibility reasons, if you need closed captions, I want to refer you to the button at the bottom of your screen, that CC, closed captions button, um, will allow you to see what we're saying in real time. We are going to record this and put it up on our website. So if you don't want to be recorded, I highly encourage you to just turn off your video so that you don't appear. Um, otherwise, you might just kind of be collateral on the side of the video. Um, when other folks watch it. So now that I've said that, we're going to get started. So we're going to begin by acknowledging the la all the land that is currently known as the United States. It's unceded indigenous territory and that California is the occupied land of over 100 tribes. We recognize the painful history upon which California exists on, including state-sanctioned genocide and state-funded state-funded genocide, displacement, and disposition of ancestral land, removal of children from their families, and laws that seek to erase Indigenous peoples altogether. This art is from artist Jackie Fawn, who is Yurok. I wanted to share some of Jackie's words. This art is how I see the vast beauty and rich culture of Native California, from the ancient redwood giant to the concrete towers of the city, California, as the rest of the country will always be native land and it's important to honor and recognize the land that we stand upon. This illustration is of a woman standing strong with the medicines our ancestors prayed with, a, a two-spirit youth holding a drum and songs of our ancestors and wearing red for M M I P murder and missing indigenous people and of an elder that has carried the knowledge of our ancestors for us to carry into future generations. We encourage everyone to research and understand the indigenous land that you are on. You can find the native land that you are on by going to native-land.ca. Now, I would like to further introduce myself. My name is Ade de Valencia. I go by she, her, ella. I am a recent graduate from the University of California, Berkeley, and I am the organizing intern for this summer. Hi, everyone. Uh, thanks for being on tonight. My name is Tammy Kresnar. I use she, her pronouns. I am a senior organizer, and I uh, am based in our SF office and joining you today from my home in Oakland. Good evening, everyone. My name is Tanisha. My pronouns are she, her. I'm the grassroots advocacy manager. I live in Oakland, and I work out of our San Francisco office, and I'm primarily responsible for our statewide legislative advocacy efforts. Hi everyone, my name is Madeline hernandez Bassan. I'm also a recent graduate, but from the University of California, Riverside. And this summer I'm the grassroots advocacy intern for the ACLU Narcal um, there in San Francisco. Now everyone, please feel free to say hello and introduce yourself using the chat box below. Include your name, your pronouns, the city that you reside in, and what are some fun things that you plan to do this summer? Thank you all for saying hello. Now for today, we'll be going over what summer recess is and updates on last year's ACLU bills. We will also discuss the four bills that we'll be focusing on this summer. Then we'll give you all a little break and we'll finish off our event with information and advice for those who will be attending lobby visits. Now, let me pass the floor on to Tanisha who will go more into detail on what summer recess is. Hi everybody, good evening again. Before I go on to what the summer recess is, can we take a pause once more to acknowledge and welcome our amazing interns? 
They've been with us about four weeks. They're both recent graduates who hope to become attorneys themselves. And so they're interning with the ACLU this summer. Um, Madeline made this presentation that we're all looking at. It took a ton of research into a lot of bills. We're going to talk about a lot of bills today. And Aureli has been working hard connecting with our various chapter members. They've been doing an incredible job these past few weeks. And I just wanted to take a moment to acknowledge them for being here and presenting all this information to all of you. Good work y'all. Okay, so let's talk about what the summer recess is. So to or understand the summer recess, we have to take a moment to understand the larger context of how bills get made here in California. So how the legislature works is that there are 40 senators who serve in four-year terms and then 80 assembly members who serve two-year terms. So there's two houses in the legislature, the Senate and the Assembly, and bills are traditionally on a two-year, there's a two-year cycle. So bills can be considered for the totality of those two years or just for the one year, the final year. Legislators are responsible for introducing and drafting bills. There was, next slide, please. Thank you so much. They're responsible for drafting the merits of bills and, and then voting to pass or kill bills. So bills are introduced in the house that's associated with that legislator. So if an assembly member introduces a bill, it will become an assembly bill or an AB. And if a senator introduces a bill, it will become a Senate bill or an SB. There are also bills that um, adjust, make adjustments to the state constitution. Those are called Assembly Constitutional Amendments or ACAs. The bills that we will be advocating for this summer are primarily assembly bills, meaning that they were introduced in the assembly, but because we're in the second house, they're now in the Senate. As bills travel through the legislature, they will be debated and then voted on several times, primarily in committees and then on the floor. And the floor refers to that time when all of the members of that house have the opportunity to debate the bill, potentially make changes on the bill, and then all of the legislators of that house will vote to either pass or kill the bill. I use the word kill here in this slide, but you won't hear me say the word kill throughout the presentation. You'll hear Madeline refer to bills as tabled or inactive. Those are polite ways to mean basically the same thing. Um, okay, let's keep going. So the timeline for this process of bills being passed in California, those are introduced in February, and then they go through their committees and they have their first floor vote in May. And so the bills that survive that first floor vote will then switch houses. So at the moment, we're, we're talking about all assembly bills. They've already gone through all their assembly committees. They've already had an assembly floor vote. And now they've been passed on to the Senate, where they're in the process of going through Senate committees right now. And they will soon have their Senate floor vote if they survive their Senate committees. So during the summer recess, the session completely pauses. There's no formal decisions, there's no committee hearings, no votes, no bills get changed while the recess is happening. The recess is a pause. Everything stops. And this is meant for legislators to go home back to their home districts. So um, legislators are supposed to represent their constituents, right? But because of the nature of their job, they have to work and many of them live at least part of the year in Sacramento. And that means they might be quite separate from what's happening in their communities at home. So during the recess, they're encouraged to actually go back home and reconnect with their constituents. They're actually encouraged to hold town halls and have meetings. And like, this is a moment for exploring, reconnecting and figuring out what's happening in their home communities and taking that feedback back to Sacramento to finish out the legislature, which is why the summer recess is a really important time for us. Ooh, we skipped the, oh no, we skipped the slide and we're having trouble going backwards. We're only going forwards. Okay, there we go. So um, 
So the summer recess is a really important time for us. Um, this time really matters. So we usually do lobby visits during the summer recess because we know the legislators are home a little bit closer to all of you, unless you live in Sacramento. But if you don't live in Sacramento, if you live in Fresno or Modesto or in Humble County, your legislator is meant to be closer to you during this time. So it's a good time for you to meet with them, for you to be talking with them about what you value and what you want them to do during those final last votes of the session. And because of the two-year cycle, this is also many, many bills. This is their last chance to live or die, um, the, the votes that are going to happen in August. Okay, so that is what the summer recess is and why it matters. I am now going to pass to Madeline to tell us a little bit about the bills that you all have been advocating for over the past year and what's going on with them. Hi, everyone. Um, could you guys type in the chat if you guys joined us for Lobby Day in Sacramento this April by any chance? If not, totally fine. We'll go over those bills. That's awesome. Whoever was there. Um, I'm going to be providing a brief overview of the bills and that we advocated in April and just give you an update on where the bills are now. So starting off first with ACA 8, a constitutional amendment, the California Constitution claims to prohibit slavery, but it currently has an exception clause that allows involuntary servitude. This means the state can force a person to work against this, their will as punishment for a crime, often under hazards and inhumane work conditions. ACA 8 would amend the California Constitution to remove the exception clause so that incarcerated people can't be forced to take any job or be cruelly punished for work absences. It provides an avenue for choice over when and where and how they can work, including whether to go to work when they're sick or the kind of educational and vocational programs that will best prepare them for the successful re-entry. The status of this case is that it has passed both the Senate and the Assembly, which is great. It will be in the, 20, in the November 2024 ballot where you all have the opportunity to make a change with your vote. Secondly, AB 2441 is a bill that is about eliminating unnecessary police interaction in school. So the overall policing of California students is causing student, students to be criminalized, pushing them out of school and creating trauma. AB 2441 would make it optional rather than mandatory for students to be referred to law enforcement for certain student behavior, allowing educators to use their professional judgment and consider circumstances and needs for students. All children deserve a fair chance to thrive in school and beyond, including students of every race and background, students with and, dis and students with disabilities. Giving educators the option will reduce inappropriate referrals and make schools a safer place for all youth. So the status of this bill, um, as you may recall, during the lobby day, it took place right after the bill passed the Senate Education Committee. And now it needs to be heard in the Senate Appro Appropriations Committee before heading into the state floor. Into the Senate floor, sorry, my bad. <laughs> um, and yeah, so that's the status of that bill. And then moving on to AC 810, um, which is our last bill um, from the, the lobby visit. It is a constitutional amendment that would have knowledge the human right in, to housing in California. Guaranteeing the human right to adequate housing would mean ensuring that all Californians have access to a home that is a safe, permanent, habitable, affordable, culturally appropriate, and close to employment opportunities, healthcare services, schools, and other community resources. The status, unfortunately, for this bill has been held at the Assembly Committee and will not be advancing this year. So now talking about the budget ask, um, public defense pilot program funding. Uh, since 2021, the state has dedicated about between 40 to 50 million per year for the public defense pilot program to support resentencing and other public defense work. This program has provided social workers, defense teams, psychiatric care and treatment for substance use disorders to those who otherwise might not have been able to afford it. It has also allowed for safe and successful re-entry of those returning to their community after incarceration and saved many from deportation due to invalid convictions. 
This funding is very important, but this year, Gov Governor Newsom proposed cutting the budget. So we went to legis so we went to the legislator and told them to continue funding the public defense pilot program for the final for this final year. Which thankfully the status we were able to secure 40 million in funding from the program signed by Governor Newsom. And now talking about last year's summer recess bills, was anybody at last year's summer visit during the recess? You guys can type it in the chat if you were. Well, moving along to AC84, um, which is about restore, restoring voting rights in prison. Um, it would allow voters to decide if California should amend a state's constitution to allow Californians serving their sentence in prison to fully participate in our democracy by restoring their right to vote. In recent years, California has made a significant and historic reforms that have expanded voting rights and voter access with the goal of achieving a more representative democracy. ACA4 would have continued this upholding trend. Unfortunately, ACA4 will not be moving forward this year as it is inactive. Moving on to AB 793, reverse demands are a form of unconstitutional digital surveillance that pose a grave risk. These demands can compel companies to search their records and reveal all of what people are looking for in particular keyword words online and the streets that they've driven. When it comes to protecting our health, reproductive rights and safety, our digital data trail matters. AB, 7, AB 793 sought to ensure Californians remain a refuge for people seeking to provide abortions or gender affirming care by taking those types of uh, dragnets, surveillance demands off the table. So the status of AB 793 is tabled at the moment. There have been recent developments that will largely that were largely accomplish what the bill intended. Earlier this year, Google decided to change the way it stores and access users' opt-in location history in Google Maps, making data retention uh, periods shorter and making it impossible for companies to access location information, apparently. Because Google is um, by far a primary recipient of geofence, geofence demands, this exciting development that helps to limit the possibility of obtaining someone's geolocation. And so the author and co-sponsors of the bill have decided not to continue moving the bill at this time. If you would like to learn more about these changes, we will post two blogs into the chat that you're able to read more about. Now we will be passing the mic, well, I'm gonna be passing the mic to Tanisha and Tammy. Hey y'all. Okay, so now I'm going to talk to you about the bills that we're going to be advocating about this summer. Um, I'm going to try to take this nice and slow, but if you um, are lobbying with us, we'll be talking to senators about these bills. And if you're not lobbying with us, there will still be ways that you can help and we need your support, whether we're meeting with your senator or not. So the first bill that I want to talk about is related to facial recognition technology. And if you've been rolling with us for a long time, you've heard us talk about facial recognition technology before. We are very concerned about facial recognition technology, <laughs> Boo! primarily because um, we believe that it is incompatible with our democratic rights. It's a very invasive form of um, surveillance, and we're deeply concerned about the error rate of this technology. We know that facial recognition technology um, does a very poor job of matching the faces of people of color and in particular black folks. Um, and in particular, when police use facial recognition technology in their investigations, it's particularly problematic. Um, it introduces new forms of bias into their investigations and worsens already existing um, biases. So if they are looking for you know, a suspect and the technology identifies someone and says, oh, this person is a match for who you're looking for, the first type of bias that's introduced is called automation bias. And it's the idea that all of us, no matter who we are, trust machines more than we trust ourselves. So that means that if the technology is saying, hey, this person is a match, we're gonna believe that. 
we're, we're going to go with the idea that that person has committed the crime. And the second type of bias that's being introduced is called confirmation bias. So once you believe something to be true in your mind, once the technology has said, hey, this person is a suspect, you're going to then look through, look at all of the evidence with this tainted lens, assuming that you already know the answer that the evidence is trying to tell you. Instead of looking at the evidence and trying to decide who is a suspect, you're then going to look for evidence that matches the conclusion you already have. And the third type of bias is racial bias. We know there's a ton of racial bias that already exists in our criminal justice system. Adding into that a form of technology that regularly misidentifies Black and BIPOC people is deeply problematic and not something that we should be doing. So the next bill, the problem... The problem with AB 1814, right? So when we talk to legislators about it, they'll say, oh, well, AB 1814 restricts the use of facial recognition technology, but it doesn't. It allows police to use facial recognition technology and puts forth these weak restrictions and exactly the type of restrictions that we've seen in place in other states when Black people primarily have been misidentified and falsely arrested using facial recognition technology. And we know that false arrests are incredibly damaging. They can disrupt someone's entire life. People have lost their jobs and thousands of dollars. They've traumatized their entire families because of false arrests. So this is not a light thing to talk about. Not only that, the way that this bill is written, it would actually make it harder for someone to bring forward a wrongful arrest case if facial recognition technology is used and is the reason that this person is arrested. So AB 1814 basically will give police a green light to go ahead and use this technology that we know not only is going to almost certainly lead to more false arrests, but we also know the ways that facial recognition technology limits people from protesting, from receiving gender affirming care, abortion care, and from being themselves. What we really want is for the legislature to completely ban police from using facial recognition technology. And in the meantime, we oppose AB 1814 because it doesn't go far enough in restricting it. Tammy, can you tell us where this bill is now? I certainly can, Tanisha. Um, so this bill has passed the Assembly floor. It has passed both the Senate Public Safety and Senate Judiciary Committees. And up next, it is in the Senate Appropriations Committee. And appropriations is budget and money. Um, and then if it passes through the Appropriations Committee, it will go to final floor votes in the Senate. But all is not lost because you can still do things and we want you to be here and do things to stop this bill. Um, so importantly, like we have a lot of senators around our region who need to hear from us. So we are asking you all to call your senator and if you are able to call your senator about opposing AB 1814, please let us know. We can give you additional information. We can give you a script to use during your phone call. We're also working on a campaign to get letters to the editor out in local papers across Northern California, uh, making sure that your fellow community members are hearing about this issue and are uh, being given education about how dangerous facial, facial recognition recognition technology is, and that this bill is something that their state senators are voting on. Um, and Tanisha just posted a toolkit that you can use to post on your social media. Some of you are part of groups or ACLU chapters that you can post on social media. And I'm sure a lot of you also have um, uh, you know, your own personal networks to be able to share more information about this bill. Tanisha, did you want to answer this question now or do you want to hold questions until the end? I just thought this question. I'm happy to engage with some questions in the chat in real time as long as we're still running on time and we are. I I don't know why facial recognition is bad at identifying Black BIPOC people. Um, I would have some guesses that are around, yes, like... Um, 
the way that the technology itself is trained and some of the biases that already exist in human beings. So when we are building this technology, our own biases are often built into it as well. Not to mention, you know, some facts around the idea that things like cameras don't do as good of a job of catching the features of Black and Asian faces. Like these are realities of our world. And then we're building technology that um, continues to exacerbate these situations. So I don't know exactly why the technology is so bad at BIPOC faces, um, but that would be my guess. Tammy, did you want to say anything about that? Um, I'm not sure there's anything else that I wanted to say on that. I think the other reason for why there is um, like all of the databases that we work on or like all of this technology is built upon databases of enormous troves of information that has been collected from uh, lots of parts of the state. Um, and we know that because of uh, systemic issues in the criminal legal system, that there are more information about people who've been involved in the criminal legal system who are people of color and who are black. Um, right. And so it also that has an impact in terms of what the data set is that it is looking at um, of misidentification or over-identification of Black folks. Exactly. Thank you so much for saying that, Tammy. It's We're building off of racist systems, and then we're building additional systems that reflect our racism right back to us. And instead of recognizing that that's what it's showing us, we're taking what it's showing us as fact. And it's extremely harmful. Um, in particular, AB 1814 would allow police to use like state data, driver's license information in their police investigations. They're not allowed to do that right now, but this law would be so permissive. It would give police incredible access to power that we, we are afraid would be immediately misused. Um, so I also want to point to to the the document that Elsie posted in the chat. Thank you. I think that's really helpful. Um, can you hear my cat's feeder? Let's hope not. Thank you. We cannot. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. And um, and really quickly before we move to the next bill, Ron asked the great question of where can you get a script for your lobby visit. We will actually be going over where to get all of the materials to prepare for your visit at the end of this training, but needless to say, we have prepared all the information and I'm so excited for you to use it and see it. I'm so glad that you want a script because Madeline spent some time making one, so we're ready. We're ready. Okay, so we are going to move to the next bill now, and I've practiced saying this, the new motor voter program. So federal law requires that when you go in to apply for a new driver's license or renew your driver's license, that you also have the opportunity to register to vote. And for 20 years, like this law was passed, and then for 20 years after that, California really struggled to comply with that law. California was having a really hard time giving people the opportunity to register when they renewed or got a new license until the new motor voter program. This program has been incredibly successful. 25 million people have gotten new registration or updated their registration as a result of this program. This program says that people who are eligible, eligible to vote will be given the opportunity to register. If they don't opt out, they are, if they don't opt out, they are automatically registered. Amazing. Um, but there's still work to be done. Anyone who's used this system knows, okay, it could still use a little bit of work. We need to modernize the registration process and we need to continue working with the Secretary of State and the DMV to, make, to meet these federal requirements. So the way that we're doing that, working through that, next slide, please. Thank you so much, Luis, is with the new Motor Voter Task Force. This task force has been essential for the success of the program. They actively monitor the program, provide guidance to stakeholders, including the Secretary of State and the DMV about how to continue to improve the program and make sure we're meeting federal laws. 
But the problem is this task force was meant, was written into law to be temporary and it's gonna end in January of 2025. But the work's not done. The task force still has work to do. I know everybody on this call cares about voting rights. I know we all want people to be able to register to vote easily. We want people to have access to voting, right? So we have to pass, we support AB 2127, which would extend the new motor voter task force. Tammy, where's this bill at? This bill has passed so many things already, including the Assembly Floor, Senate Elections and Constitutional Amendments Committee, the Transportation Committee, and up next, it is in the Senate Appropriations Committee. Again, budget, money, funding. Um, and then it will go to final floor votes in the Senate. Um, and again, this bill can use your help. Please do call your senator and please let us know if you're going to call our senator, your senator. Um, it's also really helpful for us to know how many of you, our ACLU volunteers and supporters, are making calls to senators about this bill. I know that none of us, it is impossible to overstate the importance of voting, especially in this year's election. Um, so we're really excited to get AB 2127 across the board. Yeah. One year, people asked me how we pick these bills, and I talked about how we picked bills that, that need a little extra push, that need some support and some help. So it's great to see that AB 2127 has kind of, you know, made it through its committee so far. We have identified that it's going to need a little bit of extra help to get out of appropriations and off of the Senate floor. So we are asking folks to call in and to talk to your legislator about this bill. Okay. Yes, we will definitely be sending bill summaries to all the attendees. You'll have a lot of information about the bills. You'll have call scripts. You'll have information about your senators. Whatever you need, we will try to provide it for you. Okay, the last bills, there's two bills. It's a double whammy that we want to talk about are around police attack dogs. So police are using these dogs to attack people. Um, people who... Sorry, let me start over, y'all. This one makes me upset. So let's just like, we're going to gather ourselves and we're going to read the notes. Police attack dogs pose a significant threat and currently operate without federal or state ride restrictions. They have a history of mauling bystanders and not stopping when they're asked to. These dogs are used where federal force is, excuse me, where lethal force is not warranted they're inflicting serious, life-threatening injuries on people, even when those people did not pose a danger to officers or to anyone else. In fact, we've studied this. The ACLU has an entire report on how these dogs are being used, if you're interested in reading it. And what we have found in this study is that the vast majority of people who are injured, severely injured by these dogs, are not armed at all. Many of them are suffering through a mental health crisis and needed to be assessed for treatment, not violently attacked. And we understand how the use of these dogs is rooted in racism, right? The practice of using dogs was used to control enslaved people who were seeking freedom. And we've all seen images of police using dogs to attack people, protesting, asking for their civil rights, participating in civil disobedience. Today, people of color and especially black men are far more likely to be injured by these dogs. So the two bills that we're talking about here, next slide please, thank you, Louise. AB 2042 and AB 3241, we oppose these bills. They do not do enough to stop this deadly practice of using dogs on people. What we need is statewide restrictions on the use of police dogs that protect both humans and dogs. What these bills do, they give the responsibility for restricting the use of canines to the Commission on Peace Officer Standards and Training. The Commission on Peace Officer Standards and Training, which is called POST. And we know that POST is primarily made up of law enforcement. 
and we don't want police policing themselves. We know that that doesn't work. Not only that, but Post has not shown that they have the ability to bring forth any meaningful transparency or reform to police behavior. We've tried this already. We've given Post the ability to try to change police behavior and it hasn't worked. So why would we try it again with these dogs? These bills will not change the status quo. It is the legislature that must step up and take on this responsibility the same way that it does for other uses of force. Therefore, we oppose both AB 2042 and AB 3241. Tammy, where are these bills now? So these bills have passed the assembly floor and the Senate Public Safety Committee. During that Senate Public Safety Committee hearing, the bills took on some amendments around the use of police dogs for crowd control and the need to give a warning before they are released, but they really didn't go anywhere far enough. And we are still opposing those bills despite the amendments that were made in the Public Safety Committee. Um, so, you know, we're gonna ask for your help. <laughs> um, we need you to call your senator and tell us that you're gonna call your senator and we will send you information about what you can say when you call your senator. Um, and we also have a petition that we um, have up around opposing AB 2042 and AB 3241. Again, for those of you who are maybe part of ACLU chapters where you have a social media presence, please circulate that petition. Please share it with your personal networks on your own social media um, in order to continue to get the word out about our opposition and how dangerous these two bills are. Okay, y'all, we took a few questions from the chat. Do we have other questions about these bills or any of the other bills that we've talked about tonight? I don't claim to be an expert, but I will try my best to answer your questions. And let me adjust our settings so that you can unmute yourself if you have a question. Thanks, Tim. We've never not had questions. Does that just mean our training was that thorough and efficient? Will you question, will you be, I think like last year, I think you kind of organized groups to go uh, visit, um, the, visit legislature's offices. Are you going to be doing that again? We are. We are having a few visits with senators this year. So when we're done taking questions here, we're gonna take a five minute break. And then we're gonna talk about if you have a lobby visit, the way that you can prepare for that lobby visit. If we're not meeting with your senator, you should feel free to hop off after, after the Q and A, no need to come back after the break. But if we are meeting with your senator, we ask for you to come back. If you're not sure, so if we were meeting with your senator, we would have called and emailed you and said, we're meeting with your senator, please come. But if you registered today, we didn't have a chance to call you, so you might not know. Or if you just are not sure, feel free to put in the chat who your senator is, or even like if you don't know who your state senator is, just put your name and we will happily look it up for you and let you know if we're meeting with your senator or not. There are many of you on this call for which we will not be arranging a lobby visit with your senator. We can go into the reasons for that. But even if we're not meeting with your senator, there are still ways that you can help. Like I said, these um, visits are going to get floor votes soon. So we do want to make sure that legislators are hearing from their constituents about these bills. So please do call, use the toolkit to post on social media about these bills. We are not meeting with Senator Dodd. We are meeting with Senator McGuire. Other questions? Gosh, this has literally never happened. How is everyone feeling? For those of you who are lobbying, do you want the break or do you want us to power through and get you out of here by seven? For me, oh, I'll speak up. Um, for me, yeah, hold on, let me get my camera on here for you. Hey. 
Hi. Um, so for uh, for me, I haven't read any of these bills, so that's why I don't have really any questions is because I haven't read through it and don't know the particulars. So that I just found out about the meeting like 15 minutes before our board meeting. So I was late coming to this one. So but I wanted to pop in. So hey, good to see you. It is I know it's good to see you too. You're from Merced, right? No, I'm living in San Francisco. Or Oh, you're in San Francisco. Okay. So it is true that if, you know, once you read through the bills, if you have questions and you're like, wait, what? You will have a staff member who will be working with you. And you can always, always, always reach out to me, reach out to any member of staff with questions about bills. And we'll do our best to get back to you as quickly as possible. Kim, is that you? Oh, hi. Yes, it is, Kim. And so I was going to say I'm game to just like plow through. And so sorry for the background noise. I was tired of the confines of my house. So I'm actually in one of the parks. <laughs> nice. It is lovely and warm here in San Francisco. Not as warm as it is in other parts of California. We know. Yeah. Um, so we've got one vote for a plow through and keep going, get you out of here in the next 20 minutes. Is anybody like, no, I really need a five minute break. All right. All right. If, if no one needs a break, I see two more votes for keep going. We're going to keep going. We're going to talk about, let me spotlight myself again so you can see me. Hi, I'm Tanisha. We're going to talk about how to prepare for your lobby visit for those of you who are lobbying. So I love the question of like, how can I get a script? If you have lobbied with me in the past years, you know that I have made a resource page. I have made a website with all of the information that you will need on it. So I just put the link to that resource page in the chat. I encourage you to go ahead and bookmark that link, save that link somewhere where you can find it again. And on the next slide, please. Last year, we made a checklist and we did an evaluation form and everybody who filled out the evaluation form was like, that checklist was amazing. Somebody was like, Tanisha, why didn't you do this before? I had to be like, oh my gosh, I'm so sorry. You're so right. So we made the checklist again this year and it'll take you through step-by-step step everything that you need to do to prepare for your visit. It'll take you through reviewing the information about the bills and those talking points. I definitely recommend just getting to know how are we talking about this bill? You can read all the detailed information about the bill. And the great thing about the checklist is that it has hyperlinks to everything that you need. So if you're reading that this first bullet and you're like, okay, well, I wanna read the talking points, click the link and it'll take you right to the talking points. I'm very proud of this checklist, y'all. Madeline made it this year, she did a great job. Um, then you will learn more about your senators. So we have prepared a biography. It's like your senator's you know, biography from online, as well as just other information about their district, demographic information, things like that. And we have pulled their voting history. How have they voted on important bills that the ACLU is prioritizing in 2023? What's their ACLU scorecard score? What's their scorecard score for other key leaders in the state? So you can take a look at their voting history for that. Then you will attend a one hour prep session. So a member of the ACLU staff will reach out to you to arrange a prep session, a practice session with all of the other constituent volunteers who are gonna be joining your lobby visit. So we'll make sure that you all have time together, that you can practice, that you can ask questions before you actually go in and have your lobby visit. I'm gonna keep going through this checklist. You'll also, no, no, don't leave me. Thank you. <laughs> you will also have the opportunity to fill out the complete um, complete the tell your story worksheet. So if you're participating in this lobby visit, right, you've already come to this hour long training, you're going to do an hour long prep session. And then you're also going to go to this lobby visit for at least half an hour, 15 minutes, half an hour. 
I'm assuming that you're really, really dedicated. You care about these issues a lot. There is a reason that you are here. Something about your values speaks to the work, and that's why you keep showing up. When I'm asking you to meet with your legislators, I really want to encourage you to share that part of yourselves. Why are you meeting with them? What do you care about? How do these bills impact you in your community, right? These lobby visits are about pushing that legislator to represent their community when they go back to Sacramento and vote. All that's to say, complete the Tell Your Story worksheet, and it'll help take you through a couple of prompts for how you can introduce your personal story into the lobby visit, and it'll guide you through how to do that. You'll review the sample agenda. So we already, you know, you can call it a script. We call it a sample agenda. We've already written out a few key um, talking points that you can use during your visit. So again, this is the pre-visit checklist. All the information that you need, we have it in two places. We have it on the resource page and we have it on this checklist. Whichever one works for you, I encourage you to bookmark one of them, save it someplace where you can find your way back to it because all the information is there. And I wanna go back to uh, this checklist. I'm so sorry, I'm not seeing the, the question in the chat. Let me go over what the, what the uh, script is and then I'll, and then I'll answer some of these questions. All right, so the, the sample agenda. Next slide, please. Thank you so much. If you want, if you feel most comfortable, you can just read straight from the sample agenda. If you're like, I just wanna go in and do my part and make sure that my Senator is hearing about these bills, feel free to just read from the sample agenda. All the talking points are there. But many of you are familiar faces. I've seen you many times. I know you know about these bills. Feel free to read the talking points, read the fact sheets and pull from those what resonates most with you. Again. These are not like my lobby visits. These are your lobby visits. So your voice is really, really important. Make it yours. So I encourage you to change around the sample agenda, cross things out, add things in from the talking points and the fact sheets. Yeah, make the sample agenda your own. Okay, so now we were gonna take a little moment to do a role play. Can someone who's been reading the chat, what's the question? What are, What's going on? I think uh, one of the main questions here is questions about um, whether we, whether there also are any opportunities to lobby assembly members. Great question. Thank you for asking that. So this year we, this year for the summer, we're primarily focusing on senators. And that's just because the bills that we're prioritizing have already started in the assembly and they've already passed through the assembly. That's also because the assembly is a larger body and in California usually is more um, in line with our values. So we often find that it's easier to introduce bills in the assembly first and they pass through the assembly more quickly before facing a harder fight in the Senate. So at this time, I don't, I, I uh, have not prepared materials for people to advocate to their assembly members about these bills, uh, but there will be opportunities to do that. Um, potentially for the floor votes and definitely next April. Yeah, so that we're not focusing on them this time because they've already voted on these bills. Okay, let's get in. Sorry, Tammy, anything else? I think there was a, a comment in the chat about one of the slides and the script being too small. Fair. Oh, um, we will we will make sure to um, give you things so that you have it in Word document um, after this meeting too. Yes. For those who are um, have lobby meetings. You can find the sample agenda on either the resource page or the checklist. And I definitely encourage you to take a take a thorough take a thorough look at it. I hope. Thank you. Okay. We're gonna do a little role play now of what a lobby visit feels and looks like. And you will do something very similar when you have your practice session with your lobby team. So Tammy and I are gonna be the are gonna play the constituent volunteers. And Aureli, do you want to be a staff member? Do you want to be a senator? Who do you want to be? I want to play a senator. You want to play a senator. Okay. Are you going to be a tough person who's going to be like, no, no, no. Are you going to be friendly? What's your vibe? Um, I would say my vibe is like moderately friendly. So like in the middle. 
Okay, moderate. Okay, a mod. Okay, a moderate senator. All right, all right, all right. Okay, so then me and Tammy, we're gonna we're gonna come talk to you about these bills. Tammy, which bills did you want to talk about? I'm open. Um, I could talk about the new motor voter program. Okay. Um, do you feel drawn to either the facial recognition bill or the police canine bills? I have a story, a personal story to tell about the police canine bills. I'm not sure if I like the story. So since this is actually just a practice, afterwards, can you give me some feedback about it? Yeah. Okay. Yes. And this is why we practice. This is why we practice. Okay. So I'll do the canine bill. I can also do the facial recognition bill. I think it's, yeah, I can talk. I'll talk about those two, but then do you want to do the like start and the end of the meeting? Yes. Yeah, I can do that. Okay. And feel free to like jump in if there's anything that I might be missing or important points. Okay. Yeah. Ditto, please help me out. You know, I've been talking for a while. I'm tired. All right. Okay. So <laughs> now, now we're going to begin our practice scene. So thank you, Senator Valencia, for meeting with us today. We're um, happy to have some of your time to talk to you about a few bills that we hope to bring your attention to. Uh, my name is Tammy. I use she, her pronouns. I am a constituent of yours, and I live in Oakland. My name is Tanisha. My pronouns are she, her. I am also your constituent. I was so happy to vote for you. So glad that you're in office. And I also live in Oakland. Okay, Senator. So the first bill that we want to talk to you about is AB 1814. So we are deeply concerned about this bill. Um, facial recognition technology is deeply problematic. And I don't think that police should be able to use that technology in their investigations. I think it's going to lead to a lot of wrongful arrests and wrongful arrests are really, really harmful, especially for, for black folks who are far more likely to be arrested. Um, so in my opinion, we need way more privacy protections, not more surveillance. It makes me really nervous to think about someone using my like driver's license photo in a police investigation without my knowledge. Like that's scary. I hate that. So I, we opposed AB 1814. Can we count on you to vote no on AB 1814? Hmm. Um, I do have a question. How does opposing this bill benefit people of color? Yeah. So um, facial recognition technology would be really harmful for people of color in California. <laughs> It would um, exacerbate already existing racial biases in our system. And we know that facial recognition technology is particularly bad at identifying Black BIPOC people. And um, in fact, in states that have had laws similar to AB 1814, many of those states have already struggled with wrongful arrests. And almost every single person who was arrested as a result of facial recognition technology has been Black. So if we implement this facial recognition technology in our state, we know that it's going to lead to wrongful arrests, and we know that that will primarily affect Black Californians. Mm, okay, good start, but I will have to read a little bit more on this. Please let us know if you have any questions. So I'm going to jump in and talk about AB 2127, which is a bill that we are asking for your support. Um, since its rollout in 2018, the new motor voter program has become one of the most powerful tools our state has for maintaining accurate voter rolls and registering new voters. The task force that is partially responsible for the program's success is actually set to sunset at the end of this year. So AB 2127 will ensure that that task force oversight body continues to address ongoing challenges and ensures the state's compliance with our federal voter registration laws. I will say personally, I moved to California in 2019. Y'all, I spent a day and a half at the DMV, literally dealing with all of my things. But do you know what I also did at the DMV, which was great is that 
through all of that process, I was able to very, very easily just uh, register to vote, be able to uh, change my New York registration and vote here in a wonderful state of California. And it was so simple. I don't even think I remember having a lot of heartache about everything else. I had no heartache about the voter registration. Um, can we count on your support for AB 2127 to extend the Motor Voter Program Task Force? Yeah, of course. Uh, you could count on me to support this bill. That's amazing. That's great. Um, I, I think, you know, this will go a long way um, to ensuring that the task force continues to monitor the program and ensures that it is effective as possible. So we're really excited to have your support for AB 2127. Thank you. Great. And lastly, we want to talk to you about two bills, both of which we oppose, AB 2042 and AB 3241. So we know that police in California are using dogs to inflict serious in injuries. And both of these bills leave it up to post to write restrictions about how police can use their attack dogs. I don't think that this is the right thing to do. I think the legislature needs to write strict restrictions on how these dogs are used. So for me, you know, I grew up on the west side of Chicago. And when we were standing, usually in the cold, waiting for the bus, you know, we would stand 5, 10, 15 minutes waiting for the bus. And I had a neighbor whose fence wasn't very secure. And they had a dog that would get out and chase us down the street. And as kids, we would go, you know, sprinting away. And at one point, I said to my older cousin, like a brother to me, I said to him, well, why are we running? Like, I think the dog's just playing, like, whatever, it's all good. And my cousin had to sit me down and be like, that dog is not playing. That dog is trying to hurt you. And the reason that we run and stand on top of a car or hop someone else's fence to get away from that dog is because if that dog gets you, it will hurt you. It will bite you. It will hold on. It will not let go. And now I've read the ACLU's report about how these dogs are being used to attack people, how they've mauled people, led to life-threatening injuries, how people who've been attacked by these dogs have never been the same again after they've been attacked by dogs in California. And I realized that my cousin did me a solid, making sure I was never attacked by dogs as a kid. And I think about like, why are we letting this happen in California? Police shouldn't be allowed to use dogs as a weapon in the same way that the legislature has written rules about how they can use their other weapons. We need rules about how they're able to use dogs. Not only that, sorry, now I'm going off on a rant, but, you know, I'm a dog lover. My family has a dog. Her name is Biscuit. She's a Pomeranian. She's the cutest thing in the world. And when I read about how police train their dogs they torture these animals. So I really think that we need to change this law. I think I oppose these two bills. Can we count on you to vote against them? Hmm, you do bring up some good points there, but I do have a question. Like, will this bill require like changes to be enforced in like the conditions that dogs, that police dogs are trained? Hmm, I, I'm not 100% sure about if either of these bills will require changes in the way that police dogs are trained. Um, I don't I don't know. So can I um can we'll I definitely I'll take notes on your question and we'll be sure to follow up um with more information on that, Senator. Okay, that sounds that sounds great because I myself do also have pets at home and I was just wondering. Thank you. I had to drink my water. Um, so thank you for the time um, for uh, this meeting. We'll definitely follow up with some um, additional information where um, thank you for your support for AB 2127 already. Is it also cool with you if we take a quick uh, screen capture so that we have something to uh, show off our lobby meeting with you to the rest of our uh, colleagues and supporters? Wonderful. Um, okay, thank you for the time, and we will follow up um, with additional information. Hi, um, I just have like a, a quick comment. And so if my phone number like appears in the screen capture, um, could you please um, like not publish my phone number? 
Oh yeah, we, and this is this is my theater of like a screen capture. We're not actually screen capturing anything. Okay, but yeah, thank you so much. All good. We definitely respect your privacy, so thanks for saying that. Okay, so that was our little practice lobby visit. That's approximately how your visit will go, hopefully. Um, and yeah, just make sure that afterwards one member of your team fills out the report back form so that we can then like know how your visit went. And the report back form is also where you let us know if the legislator had any questions so that we can then follow up. And yeah, if they ask a question you don't know, please feel free to say you don't know. And um, I had not filled out the share your story worksheet. So my personal story rambled off a little bit, but if I'd filled out the worksheet, I would have had some good, some good ideas about how to phrase my personal story in order to flow a little bit better into a lobby visit. I will also say at the end, like I should have had something prepared to just be like, thank you for your support on this. As a reminder, we are here to ask for your opposition to the facial recognition bill 1814 and to the police canine bills AB 2042 and 3241. As your constituents, we hope you can care and we can count on your alignment with our concerns on these issues and like state your case then <laughs> very clearly for them right at the end, which I didn't do, which is why we practice and it's helpful for us too. And this is why we practice. And yeah. Okay. So you, so as the next steps, you will have an opportunity to practice with your lobby teams, just like we just did. If you are having a lobby visit, you will soon hear from a member of staff who will be reaching out to, first of all, make sure that you know, um, and also to schedule your practice time and to talk with you about when we'll actually schedule a visit. We're currently in the middle of scheduling visits, so we will try to make sure that we work around your schedule where possible, but it also depends on when your senator is available. Um, so please just like look out for those emails, be as responsive as you can. I posted the links to everything in the chat, but we're also going to send you an email Friday morning with this presentation, with all the links that you need. If we are not lobbying with your representative, then your email Friday morning will look different. It will have all the information about other ways for you to get involved and help out. Um, and so if you want to do that, feel free to email me back and let me know if you need any additional resources. Like the email Friday morning will say, call your legislator. You can feel free to email me back and be like, Tanisha, please send give me the number. I can do that for you. All good. Um, so those are your next steps. And that's the end of our presentation. But I'm happy to stick around if anyone has additional questions. Thank you. If not, enjoy your evening. Thank you so much. Thank you. Have a great night. Thank you, everyone. Thank you all. Were there any questions in the chat I didn't answer? Is it good? Okay. If I'm going to give another pause in case anyone else has questions.